Hello everyone, this is Bradley. Today we are going to replicate another Houdini tutorial made by Constantin Magnus. And we are going to use the volume grid and grid gradient functions again in Blender 5.0. In the last tutorial about flow field and obstacle avoidance, we used them more as a workaround. This time we really needed them just like in Houdini tutorial. Even if you, you don't use Houdini or have no plans to learn it, I think it will be interesting to watch the original tutorial to compare and contrast how we approach the same problem and the concepts using different software and the tools. Especially when Constantine was typing all those VEX functions, obviously we are not going to touch any code here in Blender. As always, I'm going to use presets which you can download for free from the link in the description. The tutorial file and the demo file will be available for monthly subscribers. So here we are in the node editor. The concept is very straightforward, but it will be easier to explain by showing you how it works. First, create a plane and add a node tree. Let's replace the group input with a cube, because you always want to start with a simple geometry to prove the concept. Then I will use mesh to density grid to turn the mesh into a fog volume. The name grid may sound weird but it's a specific term used to describe an open VDB volume. And that's why we have this terminology. We also need to scatter points within this volume. So let's add a point distribute. I just updated this preset to support the grid. So we enter volume mode and set it to grid so we can receive the grid input and distribute desired amount. By default, we have about 15 points. That's too many for demonstration, so let's decrease it to 5. Now we have prepared the two geometries required for our function. We have points and we have a volume. Let's add a simulation zone to save our future work. We put the points in, we put the volume in, and connect them head to toe. You can use a viewer, you can use a viewer to check the output. It's important to note that whatever we put in simulation zone will loop back to its input over time as you play the animation. Within the simulation zone, I firstly want to remove the volume surrounding these points. So let's take a proximity fall and set it to geometry mode to take our point as input. Next, we subtract our volume with the fall you will immediately see a warning saying that we need a scale offset for meaningful evaluation. It's basically assigning a distance for the volume elimination. So let's increase the scale offset. It may not be obvious in the viewport, so let's add a mass multiply node and set it to a high enough value. Now you can see how much of the volume we are eliminating with this distance. Here I will turn on decimal shift for better value precision. As we remove the volume, we are generating a gradient. We will use grid gradient to calculate a direction for our points to move forward. We can briefly visualize this vector gradient. It looks like red, green, and blue, each representing the X, Y, and the Z directions. To move the points, we will use set position. Directly outputting volume to set position will through an arrow. And thus, we need a sample grid node to convert volume information to geometry information. By enabling and disabling our set position, we can see the point's movement. To better track the movement of these points, let's add a tracer. Now, let's play the animation. You will notice points are moving too fast, generating these sharp streaks. We will fix that. But before doing so, let's add a bevel curve to better visualize the curves. I will increase the decimal shift one more level to make them thinner. Now, back to our vector. We basically just need to scale down the vector for simulation. First, normalize the vector to make their speed consistent regardless of the gradient strength. Then scale it down. In the last tutorial, I used the delta time. This time, I'm too lazy. So I will just use value precision. Now when you play the animation, it's not perfect, but we can see a prototype of what we are looking for. 
the points are moving towards the center and they repel each other in distinctive direction. The rest are mostly parameter issues. Let's go back to where we generated our volume. In the current Blender version, we don't have a good view to distinguish all these kind of volume cells. But from experience, I can tell it's quite high. So I will use value precision to control it better. Instead of the default 0 0.3 for our grid, right now our value position is outputting a value as 1 divided by 10, and thus 0 0.1. So I will feed that to our voxel size directly. You can actually see the original bounding box becomes much smaller as I input a smaller voxel size. Now, if we play the animation, we get a long-lasting and a crazier line generations. If we also visualize the volume, you will see a process where our points are eating the volume, and this eating process is responsible for their movement. Let's fix some parameter issues that cause sharp turns. Generally, that suggests the points are turning too fast, so we need to decrease the vector speed further. I will increase decimal shift again and adjust some values. Playing the animation, you should see it move slower with smoother curve and uh, rounded turns. You can reduce the velocity further, but I will stop here and uh, move on to other improvements. One more change you can make is to smooth the curve you generated. I have a preset called Smooth Curve. Insert a node and you will immediately see the differences. Especially at sharp turning points, this Bezier handle method makes them look much nicer or natural. There are other methods you can try, such as smooth position methods. You can experiment with these settings yourself. For now, I will stick with the defaults. Generally, you will find the curves not intersecting each other. As we have the setup nearly completed, we can start switching our object. Let's add a Suzanne monkey and a Poet into our node tree, replacing the cube. Playing the animation, you will see it works well, but you may notice it may, but you may notice it still looks too cubic, because we are missing the ears on both sides. This happens because when we firstly created this volume, uh, those ears disappears already, unless you turned the density up incredibly high. Instead of increasing this density, I will expand the volume using normal displacement on our mesh. Cranking up the normal displacement, you should see the ears start to emerge. Now playing the animation again, you will see the lines invading ear area properly. Speaking of the object, I want to call attention to the voxel size again. If you look at the default cube in geometry nodes, it's these sides. However, if you actually shift the A to add an object's default cube, you realize it's actually much bigger. Now, if you pull that cube into our node tree and replace our input mesh, playing the animation, you will notice the points stop prematurely. I found that this relates to the voxel size. Since the actual cube is larger, we need to bump up the voxel size a bit. Here, I will increase it by two times. Playing the animation, it behaves much better again. There are still some imperfect tangles. And uh, basically, you want to match the voxel size with the proximity fourth distance. So we will also make that two times and play again. You should see much better results. The tutorial basically ends here. There is one more shading part in the original Houdini tutorial. Let's add a set material node and a pick a material. To pass information to the shader, we need to store a named attribute. I will call it C for color. Constantly use a position lens function in BEX, so we replicate that in node. In the shader, let's call the attribute C. Usually, we want the values in the range of 0 to 1 for color ramp, but this is likely above. For convenience, I will just divide it by 2. As long as the value is between 0 and 1, 
we can use a color ramp to map it, giving a red on the outside and the yellow towards the interior, and so on and so forth. Overall, this isn't a very difficult setup. Although I don't know if it will be more useful than making crazy water pipes, I think it's a good opportunity to learn more about the grids. It's also an interesting example of how we have two geometries inside a simulation zone. One influences the other, and that other then influences it itself to create the effect. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll probably see you next time. Bye-bye.